Good to welcome you to the museum. Uh, I'm Paul Bonberg, and I want to particularly thank the, our members and sponsors of the Historical Society who keep this, this organization functioning and to our guests here tonight. Tonight's a really special night, and let me just say a, a moment of, uh, about it before we, uh, I turn it over to, to Cleve and, and Gilbert. You know, I've done, I did activism for a very long time, and often the political work and so on of the period fades, and people forget, say, Ronald Reagan's budget cuts and a whole series of things that at the time were incredibly important. But I find that what endures is art and is culture. And that <coughs> years later, people will remember the art that was created and the culture that was created uh, out of a time. And what it speaks to is that sometimes when a community is in crisis, artists emerge and they create responses to those times. And uh, one such development occurred in San Francisco in 1978 when Gilbert created the Rainbow Flag. Um, there's a process to that about how the flag was created and the story of the times, but uh, to me it's, a, it's an extraordinary event, how uh, a little city and a little community and, uh, you know, the artists... And a big queen. <laughs> <laughs> the artists over here made it happen. And I, I, I you know, I, I, I've told you this, Gilbert, but many times people will come in from all around the world, they'll know the rainbow flag, but it hasn't crossed their mind that there must have been someone who created it. And we show them the sewing machine and say, here's the sewing machine that sewed some of the first rainbow flags. And it's just an overwhelming, it's like I showed them Hercules Club or something. It was just amazing that in fact, of course, it dawns on, of course, there was a community, there's a creator of the flag, there must have been a sewing machine or how it went. I think it's a very important image for our community. And I think they were, we were fortunate to be able to have some discussion of how it came to existence in the story at that time. So I asked Gilbert, could we just do an event where you came and talked to people, and maybe we do as an interview, and Gilbert suggested maybe Cleve would do the interview, and we could hardly get a better, a better, <laughs> a better parent than Cleve asking Gilbert about he knows the, all the secrets. I know all the dirt. <laughs> so let me introduce to you then Gilbert Baker. Thank you. So, um, Last night I was thinking about what I wanted to get out of this, and I knew there'd be uh, people showing up that also carry in their hearts and their minds a lot of our history as well. And so there's a couple of things sort of jumbled up in my mind about this. Um, first, uh, Gilbert got to San Francisco in 1970, and I got here uh, towards the end of 1972, uh, just as this neighborhood was beginning to change from mostly uh, Scandinavian and Irish working class families to uh, the first of its many transformations over the last 40 years. And uh, at that time, the symbol for what we now call the LGBT rights movement, but which we then quaintly referred to as gay liberation, um, was the lambda, the Greek letter L, and of course the pink triangle from the Nazi death camps. We also had the intertwined uh, gender symbols. <coughs> And by 1977, I remember actual conversations with people saying we needed a new symbol. I remember specifically sitting in the old Badlands with Hank Wilson talking about the, the, the lambda was too obscure and the, the pink triangle was too depressing. So there was this active uh, conversation about symbols, and I think that, that would be an interesting thing to talk about tonight. Um, in my mind, the, the, the evolution of the symbols is also kind of parallel to the evolution of, our, of the words that we use. When I joined the Gay Liberation Movement, it was the Gay Liberation Movement. And then uh, lesbian women demanded to be named specifically, and it became gay and lesbian. And then now it's LGBTQIA, I, I don't know, I can't keep track. Um, but I find it ironic that uh, some of the young people I work with uh, condemn me for using the word tranny and insist that I use the word queer, which is just so odd to me because in, in my life, tranny was always a term of endearment <laughs> and, and queer was what they said before they hit me. So um, I guess I, my first question to you, Gilbert, would okay, be- Okay, here we go. That, um, <laughs> Buckle up, everybody. When are you giving us that flag call back? <laughs> well, let me, let, me just, uh, let me just go right to that because that was a little bit of a controversy. Uh, from the very get-go, that project, the flagpole at Harvey Milk Plaza is what we're talking about here. Um, uh, people do not realize that took me more than 10 years of work and countless ass-kissing to make that happen. Um, in 
I, roughly about 10 years after Harvey died, uh, Dick Pavich and Jim Rivaldo, who were Harvey's aides, um, got some money together and somehow got the city to designate Harvey Milk Plaza. And they got the plaque and they got some letters. And it was really the first time we'd honored Harvey with any kind of public monument, right? And I loved it. It was wonderful. I remember making a big thing and wearing a white dress for the opening and everyone was there. It was really exciting and, and, and important to honor Harvey in a public way. But one of the things I didn't like about it was that it was underground. And one of the things I learned from Harvey was the importance of visibility. I mean, Harvey was an incredibly theatrical character and really had an appreciation of art and theater and, and the power and impact of visuals that, um, that he shared and, and really informed and taught me. So I always felt that the plaza needed something soaring. And of course, the rainbow flag something I love, and I thought, well, it would fit very perfectly there. So um, it started with making some paintings. I always start all my big public projects with paintings or drawings. And I made a couple of paintings and waltzed them through City Hall for three or four years, to absolutely no avail, um, all the while doing research, research, research. Finally, um, I buttonholed Willie Brown at the Castro Street Fair and explained to him how a flagpole would be very simple, be very elegant, and I happened to know that there was an extra flagpole sitting over at the Department of Public Works, just laying <laughs> on the floor. And, um, and Jeff Sheehy, who was a, a, at the time the president of the Harvey Milk Club, was with me at the time, and we got him to agree to do it, and Jeff sort of held his feet to the fire, and sure enough, uh, like a week later, I was with Tom Taylor, my good friend there, and, and great patron and mentor all these years, and Tom and I were out there with the Department of Public Works trying to figure out how we were going to anchor a 100-foot flagpole basically into air because it's all the muni substructure there and work with the guys. And I wanted to place it in the middle of Market Street or centered so you could see it for miles and reflect the ferry building. And up it went. And um, that was uh, really one of the highlights of my life, truthfully. And one of the things I particularly loved about that project was the way that we dedicated it on November 7th, which was the day Harvey was elected. Usually people commemorate his death and, and his assassination, but we wanted to remember the moment he really uh, became a very powerful, important civic uh, leader, and, and more importantly, a global leader. So um, that was really an exciting moment to be able to finally see the rainbow flag up over the Castro in such a huge and glorious way, and like in five seconds, it was like, oh yeah, it's been there forever. <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> and let's muck it up. Um, but I want to go back. Okay, so, go back. Um, so, 1977. So let, let me finish that thought, because I didn't quite get to the punchline. <laughs> Don't fuck with my art. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so, let's just go back to 1977. And there are many people who were in the room now who were here then, and we had these symbols. We had the lambda, and we had the pink triangle, and we had the intertwined uh, gender symbols. So uh, obviously, as you were, were thinking this, um, was, was there a, an epiphany? Was there a startling yes. moment? And then, uh, clearly, you were aware of the, the, you know, this was a potent symbol, a symbol that's been used in many cultures and many faiths in many different places and times. So what did you learn about the rainbow as a symbol and what was going on in your head during that period? Well, you mentioned 1977, and I'm seeing so many familiar faces here, low key, all of so many people, Jim. Um, that was a pivotal year. That was the year of Anita Bryant. It was the year of Robert Hillsborough. It was the year Harvey was elected. And that was the year that our community was galvanized. Our, our parade, if you will, went from being 50,000 to being 250,000 people. People got involved in ways that changed everything. So for Harvey me, got elected. Harvey was elected. And so for me, um, the flag came from, again, from Harvey saying, we need more visuals, we've got to be visible, visible, visible. I remember making hundreds and hundreds of signs and banners and all kinds of stuff over at John Adams Community College and 
my good friend Tandy Ballou and I made many, many things for that parade. And, um, <clears throat> and as we were doing it, 1977, I began to have an awareness of the American flag because we had just come out of the bicentennial in 1976. And I really hadn't really thought about flags very much. But when the bicentennial came around, the American flag was on everything. I mean, literally everything. And you know, tacky, horrible souvenirs and fantastically beautiful art. And it just translated itself into all kinds of things. And I thought, you know, we could have a flag because flags become so many different things. They, they're, they're more than cloth. They're an idea. So I began to have this, uh, this idea that we could have something, a flag. That, that would be the, the way for us to have this new symbol to answer the pink triangle, which was so negative and put on us by you know, the Nazis. And, and the, the lambda, which was Greek and a little obscure and didn't really express the full diversity. And the rainbow is a natural flag. It's a piece of the sky, so it fits there in the sky perfectly. And what I liked about the, the symbolism of the rainbow, and it was when I decided to make a flag, it wasn't one second later that I decided the rainbow was it. Because really, it fits it was, it, instantly, it was the first absolutely. Thing. Because it was the first thing, and, and it was just my gut reaction, because it fits us. It's uh, all the colors, it's so it, 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 it's lasted because it represents all the genders, it represents all the the races, everything. It's the, it's the rainbow of humanity. And, and what I wanted to do was to expand on our use of the visual elements to say something that was gonna be globally appealing and not depend on language. And that's the interesting thing about the rainbow. Is I, I was basically just a dumb drag queen, you know, a lot of high heels and you know, a fair amount of talent. <laughs> and, uh, but I really did not know that much about it. But as I got into it, <clears throat> I right away realized, well, obviously it goes to the Native American culture. It's very, very prominent in the island culture. And I began to understand how the rainbow in, in history was used as a symbol of hope, was used as a symbol of uh, liberation in cases. So it really had a, a history, and of course, living in San Francisco, the Haight-Ashbury and the whole hippie psychedelic movement, which I was heavily influenced by. Um, all of that played into my mind, but I thought that the rainbow just particularly fit us because, as I said at the time, we're a global tribe, and, and we should have a flag to proclaim our global power. So I remember when we you allowed me to help dye the fabric. <laughs> and we were using the, what was then the community center at 330 Grove Street. Um, can anyone recall when that opened? Because before we had 32 Page Street. Does anybody here remember 32 Page Street? We're the only ones. We're the only ones. Oh, <laughs> God, we're old. Um, so, but I remember at one point telling you you should patent the rainbow, and you didn't. So how do you Sorry. feel when you travel around the world and see all this rainbow crap everywhere? And crap. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and magnets and caps, and you don't make a penny off any of it. No, I don't. But it's not about money. It's about power. It's but you made it. <laughs> Yeah. And you, did, you, did you make a conscious decision to allow this to become a, a public? Domain? I had no idea what I was doing. I, okay, just, just verify the record. record. Right. I mean, I knew I was, I, I did not even know that people would get that it was a flag. So we actually made two. And Cleve was there. And my friend Glenn McElhaney, who founded Dykes on Bikes, many people. Anyway, my good friend Ferry Argyle from the Angels of Life was a, a tie-dye queen, really knew it, and knew that I was making flags. And I came over to the center, and we talked about dyeing the fabric, and I decided, well, a flag has to have a, a history. It has to be imbued with you know, symbolism, starting with the very fabric that it's made from. So in 1978, it was natural everything, natural dye, natural fabric, hippie hippie. Big, giant mess you can't even imagine. And, um, and 
uh, we, that we didn't know what we were doing, so we would you know, mix all the dye bath, and then our arms would be stained like axe murderers, you know. <laughs> and, and, and there's a piece of, of the hand dyed fabric up there in that, in, in that, in very incredibly beautiful colors. But back to the flagness of it. And in the photograph, you'll see that we made one with a, a field of tie dyed stars. And because I wasn't really sure people would get that it was a rainbow flag. So we put the stars in it thinking, okay, well, they'll think it's like the American flag and they'll get that it's the flag. So, uh, and they were huge flags, 30 by 60 feet. They didn't last more than, what, two years? I guess they just shredded instantly. And, of course, they got wet and the colors ran. Whoops. But uh, uh, it wasn't even all the way to the top of the pole the very first day, and people owned it. Yeah, it was incredible. Yes. I remember uh, unbundling it, and just as we were starting to raise it, a gust of wind came through, and it billowed out, and it went up, and I got goosebumps all over. And that was the entry point for the parade as people came up. And that was, I think, was that the first year that the parade was huge? Huge. That, I think that was the response to Anita. No, the seventy-seven was no, like seventy-seven, but was it was crazy. bigger than seventy-seven. It was but it was just huge, and all these tens, tens of thousands of people from all over the world, as they came off Market Street, he turned around, and there it was, right at the entrance to Civic Center Plaza. And people, it, I, th I think it, that that became our flag. That, that, that at that at that moment, tell people about the eight colors and how that changed to six. What, what are the significance of the eight colors and why is it six now? Well, in the beginning, the eight colors came from, of course, again, being very deliberate about picking. Um, eight is a very magical number in China. Um, it's an even number, which allowed me to split the spectrum into hot and cold colors. Um, it let me play with more than just the Roy G. Biv that everybody knows from, you know, play school. Uh, toys, mm -hmm. rainbow, even before me, and um, and I, it gave me a way to incorporate pink, because I, it is a, an important part of our history to not forget the the pink triangle. So, of course, it was fuchsia hot pink, and and, <laughs> and and then I was allowed to bring another color into our our rainbow, if you will, and that was turquoise, um, and which I've always loved, and kind of connected again to the Native uh, American and the island culture. It's a lovely, magnificent. Uh, uh, color. So, if flag goes up, it's a hit. Within a week, people are calling me up, I need a flag, I need a flag, I need a flag. I realize I'm never going to be able to make all these flags. So I went over to uh, Paramount Flag Company. This is after the 78 parade and, and got them interested. I said, well, I have a flag, it's the gay flag. And they're like, gay flag? What are you talking about? And I finally got them interested in it enough to, to make some for me. And then the following year, 79. Those were those eight colors or six colors? In 79, I, they, they created flags for Market Street. It was the first time I put flags down Market Street. And they just flat out told me, there's, there's, there's no pink. We've already used, I mean, I made mean, maybe 100 or 200 flags with the pink that was available. It's just not in the, the palette of, of, of fabrics that flags are made from. And so I had to... You know, they called me in the office. They said, what do you want to do? You want to make one flag and fly it once a year? You want to make a lot of flags and get it around the world? And I was faced with a compromise, and, and I did. I, I realized, well, actually, it's really not about the number of colors. It's about the idea of the rainbow, the idea of the spectrum, and using that as a way to, to you know, give voice to the idea that our sexuality is a human right, and beautiful, like the rainbow. So... It was a compromise I made in 79, and then of course it just became more and more and more popular because I was able to make it more and more available. People don't remember that in 1978 when I made the, the first one, four color printing was insanely expensive. I mean, now we have digital everything. But just to be able to make a postcard or do anything with it graphically, which is an important part of a flag, is to be able to express it more than in cloth, but, but in, 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 in the way it became the names of organizations and all their logos and their artworks, it was really important to, to, to its development that, that I simplified it, or I think maybe it would have taken longer, or maybe not even have happened. There's seats up here, folks. Um, so what were the, uh, you assigned a certain meaning to each one of the eight colors in the original flag. Do you remember those? I words? do. Okay. 
It's a test, everybody. I did. Here's a little one. Uh, and that's because flags need to have depth. And of course, you know, what, is, what does the American flag mean? You know, the white and the blue and all the things. So, so we had to think about it. And that was kind of a hodgepodge of our sort of, you know, psychedelic hippie ideas with a little color theory and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we came up with pink for sex, right off. Uh, because it's about our sexuality as a human right, whatever. Uh, red for life, because that's traditionally what re represents or courage in most flags. Orange for healing. And we used orange for the Briggs campaign, which was mm -hmm. happening in 1978. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a very important uh, graphic effort that Jim Rivaldo was doing, so it was all about orange. Yellow for the sun, also very common. Green is for nature. Turquoise is for magic. And blue is serenity, and purple is for the spirit. So when I made the compromise in 1979, I felt a little, I felt a little tinge of guilt because I thought, well, I'm taking out sex and magic. <laughs> and it took me 25 years to be able to really bring it back um, <clears throat> and to be able to have enough you know, um, wherewithal to get the industry to recognize it that the A-colored was the original. Uh, it took me a long time to get the flag industry to recognize it as a gay flag. It took 10, 10 more years. That's, that's where I wanted to go next, actually. Was, so how, can you explain to people how it is that flags are sort of recognized and uh, legitimized and made official? And who, what are the, I can't, I still can't say the word, but the association of Vexillographers. Vexillographers. Yes. So talk a little, and when, when, did, when did the world first say, agree with you that this was in fact the flag of the LGBT movement? That came around about 10 years later, 87, 88, and I had tried and tried. They have a trade association of flag makers, vexillographers, if you will. It comes from the Latin word vex, which is the, the symbol that the Romans would carry. Um, Anyway, they have the trade association. There's two of them. There's the National Association of Vexillographers, which is the U.S. based, and there's an international association. And they have, you know, their, their conventions and congresses and their rules, and they pretty much decide on what a, you know, what, what a flag is. You know, they, they set the, the industry standards and all of, all of those things. But <clears throat> they would not even entertain a motion that there was such a thing as a gay flag. Um, it took me a few years and a lot of work. Jim Farrigan, who was a, a really a great scholar and I worked with at Paramount, um, was really the one that led the charge there. Um, uh, they just, they took one look at me and my pink hair and you know my leopard skin lame and they're like, <laughs> what? He, he, he was able to pass more. Uh, it, it was able to get that through. It took it took ten years. You know, the the thing was, a lot of good old boy flag companies down in Texas did not want to know anything at all about a gay flag because it was very it, it was challenging. Really, people think of the flag and they think of the American flag or maybe their state flag or something. The rainbow flag really was you know in your face. Really, here we are. So it took a long time and a lot of education to get people around. And what did it was the money. When I went to Paramount, uh, uh, Mr. Tudor, rest his soul, the old owner who was totally in business because he loved flags, never made it, gave all the money away, uh, you know, but kept it going uh, and loved flags. Um, and he was really pivotal because he took a chance on me. You know, I, I remember uh, saying, you know, if we made some little flags, uh, more people could buy them. They could be like a dollar or something. And he finally agreed to do that, I think, 79 or 80. And I think I, we ordered, I, think I ordered 5,000 little flags. Sold out in two hours, ka -ching. And then all of a sudden I was golden. And then the word started getting around that gay people were buying these rainbow flags, right? And Paramount, of course, had the corner of the market and... and, and and pretty soon other flag companies started making them and others start, you know, and all of a sudden they're showing up and then you know, 10 years later all those in favor of the gay flag, yeah, get those pink dollars in here, right? And um, so that's really what did it, was that it, it, it established a, uh, 
a market for all kinds of rainbow things. And within 10 years, it was on dog collars and on, you know, it was unbelievable. So you, you were part of the commercialization of Pride. I engineered it. <laughs> <laughs> I take, I've I always liked that. that part of the story, though, because it, it's just funny that this, this very, you know, supposedly radical and, uh, you know, this radical symbol of sexual liberation became ubiquitous because it became profitable to the straight, mostly straight people that manufactured it. <laughs> and Gilbert uh, successfully navigated that and manipulated it. So you wanted to create a symbol that was for all of us. So how did you feel when the leather community decided they wanted their own flag and the bears decided they wanted their own flag? Was that a disappointment to you? No, not at all. Uh, it was inevitable. I remember in 1979, when I was gonna put my rainbow flags for the first time down Market Street. Now, remind me, it was 1979. Harvey had been assassinated. It was a very dark time. We were mad. Uh, putting the flags down Market Street for the parade that year was an important thing for me because it was the first time it had ever been decorated. I had to go to City Hall, and I was in the, the chief administrative officer of Roger Boas's office. Well, now, if we let you put those rainbow flags on poles, well, then everybody's going to want to do it. You know, we'll have the we'll have the Cinco de Mayo people in here, the Chinese New Year's people in here, the da 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 da, and we absolutely cannot let you do this. And I listened to that, listened to that, and I thought, well, why not? What's the problem? You should. And I think that that kind of blew their minds. They were like, well, actually, I said, look, this is San Francisco. It's multicultural. We should celebrate every culture. We should, you know, flags are beautiful. And also, San Francisco has a long reputation as a city of flags, you know, way before the rainbow flag. So uh, it, was a, it, it, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened fairly quickly, the the use of the rainbow flag by gay people. It was San Francisco, you know, first it was, you know, on Castro Street and Polk Street, and then people putting them on their houses and, and then on their businesses, and then all of a sudden they're putting it in their store windows like it's, you know, American Express, you know. It didn't, didn't mean anything. It was just like, get your gay friendly. But that was the point of it. It was like, you know, it was like a safe, a safe thing. You know, that if the rainbow flag was on a building or a place, you knew that that the, those were our people, that those were friendly people and safe. So, and that is what I see when I go around the world today, when I see the rainbow flag. People have no idea who I am. And, but I see how they're using it in their communities and, and how those places are their safe places. So that's, that's the, the joy for me, the fulfillment as an artist, is to know how people love it. I remember once driving back when I was still living in Southern California and I was driving back down on the five through the Central Valley and it was in the summer and the fields were all blasted and brown and it was dusty and I didn't want to go back to Southern California and I felt sad about leaving and I'm driving along and out in the middle of nowhere, stuck on top of a barbed wire fence was a little tiny rainbow flag and I'm, where was he? <laughs> <laughs> But it really, it's amazing how much it's taken off. And I think that it, you know, I asked about the bear flag and the leather flag because I think one of the things that's weird about us is, and it's always been, I think it's part of why it's so difficult sometimes for us to organize ourselves, is that what is it we have in common? Um, we're not like racial minorities. Uh, we don't have that kind of shared history transmitted through generations in our families. We're born into every color of skin that there is, every uh, income level, every faith background, every political ideology. We're, it's like herding cats if you're uh, trying to be an, an activist. <laughs> so I think that, to me, the, the rainbow flag and it's the, the way it has been embraced by so many of us from so many different backgrounds, I think is evidence of a desire for solidarity among our people, despite these differences. And, you know, this was an issue identified long ago, even in, as early as the 1920s, Magnus Hirschfeld wrote that uh, there was no group of people that felt less solidarity or was less equipped to fight for their basic rights than homosexuals. Um, 
so I want you to go back to that issue. So you, you created this unifying, what you intended certainly to be a unifying symbol and what I think was perceived by most people as a unifying symbol. When you first heard that the leather people wanted their own flag, what was your first gut reaction to that? I, I didn't really have a problem with it because I kind of like a little, like kind of have a little leather thing going on myself. So, uh, <laughs> so it didn't really bother me. I mean, this comes from identity politics. I thought the rainbow was broad enough that it could embrace everybody, leather, drag, all of it, all of us, the whole rainbow all of uh, our human experience. And so I understood their desire to, to bring their own visibility, to bring their own agenda, if you will, their own idea forward, the same with the bear and other things. So I understood it. I, I, I say this uh, with some humility. A, a flag is something you can't design. A flag is torn from the soul of the people. That's what makes a flag a flag. I mean, you can sew and you can design and and you can mark it and all of those things, but what makes a flag a flag is that people own it. It's connecting to their souls. It's something about that that expresses who they are. That's why they, they put it on their house, they wear it on a t-shirt or whatever. It belongs to them. So I understand the desire for the leather people and others. Now, just to segue a little ahead, 2003, I'm in Key West, I'm famous, I'm fabulous, I'm working on my second world record, and my friends in New York calling me up saying, Gilbert, they're stealing the rainbow flag in Europe, they're putting peace symbols all over it. That was my next, the And I'm like, right what are you talking about? I said, haven't you seen? And I was like, well, no, and so I finally kind of, so it was during the Iraq war, so sure enough, all of a sudden, everyone in Europe's calling, have you seen the rainbow flag with Pache and the peace symbol? I thought, well, I actually kind of like it. People are saying, they're stealing our flag, I'm like, Wait a minute. We are the peace and love people. So I took it as a huge validation yeah, of our too. movement that the rainbow, you know, had, had yet even another incarnation as this as a peace tool. So I I, I, I was thrilled by that. And I, I still see those flags around once in a while. And, yeah. and I, I kind of laugh when I remember people just hysterical, they're stealing it from us. <laughs> no, I felt very proud because I, yeah. and I also, I'm quite certain that all the people in the peace movement that adopted it knew full well that this was our flag. Of and course. So I felt really proud. And a lot, of, a, a lot of the peace movement was larger. gay people. I mean, we go back to the Vietnam era and I mean, I'm a Vietnam era veteran myself. And, and, and a lot of my politic comes from that time. So I'm very proud of the way that, that we as a LGBT people have, have always been at the forefront of, of, of the peace movement. You know, we, we're the love people. That's why we're on this planet, to, to you know, solve the population problem and, and to bring light and love in the world. And, and, and that's, that's why we're fabulous. <laughs> Gilbert, can you say something about you as a, I mean, my sense is you were an activist as well as an artist and some of the you just mentioned the politics of time and you as a, involved in the peace movement and I assume everybody here has seen the film Milk and my, you mentioned Harvey, my assumption is you were, had a connection. Could you talk about basically your role as an activist before you, in other words, what, what were you doing in San, were you doing politics in San Francisco? Were you doing politics around Harvey? And what, say something about what you were doing. Yeah, the, the thing for me is I'm an artist. That was always my activism. I mean, Cleve is an incredible organizer and, 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 and so well-spoken. And I think that's why we got along so good. In 1978, he ran the media committee, surprise, and I ran, I ran the decorating committee. <laughs> we hit it off instantly. And, uh, and, and, and then he came up to the top four gallery, and, and we were young. I mean, we were, we were the young whippersnappers in those days. And, and um, so, but for me, my, my activism comes from my art. So I use my talent, my, my vision, to create artworks that are thought-provoking, that are witty, that are challenging, and, and, and not just flags, but many, many things. And that's, that's, my, that's my role. I think what Cleve said something earlier, you know, the thing that does connect through all the generations and all of us together to make this global tribe, as I call it, is that each one of us has this moment in our life where we come out, where all of a sudden we accept who we are, we know who we are, and all of a sudden we're not living a lie. All of a sudden we're gonna 
we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go with, into the light. We're gonna live in the truth, and we and we accept who we are as people, and we come out. I mean, that was Harvey's whole thing: come out, come out, come out. And that is the same story every one of us has. We came out. We found out who we are: lesbian, gay, bisexual. We we're true to that, and that is the connecting thing between all of us. So for me, part of 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 that coming out is to is to find out who are you as a person more than just your sexuality but you, you act, ask about my activism well of course i want to be involved in changing the world and how can i do that well i'm an artist so i became very committed to using that's that's my tool i mean some people can organize or or, or do many different things my tool was that i had a skill and, 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 and was in the right place to, to use it. I think, you know, when I, look, when I remember those times, I, I think all of us were really aware that we were being allowed to participate in something that really was new. And you didn't have to be necessarily political or well-educated or even all that smart to know that you know, what we were doing here had never been seen before, and it was so exciting. And uh, I, I look at the way we treat each other now, and I, I'm working on a book, and I, I read a little bit of it to Gilbert last night, and one part that I read was to be young and gay, then you would see other young gay people here. And if you were walking to, through the financial district or wh wherever you were, if you saw another gay man or lesbian woman, and you would you'd make eye contact, you would smile, you'd, you'd say hi. You know, there was a great sense of solidarity and um, excitement that this new thing was happening and that we got to be part of it and it came here from most of us from other places and uh, our collaboration really I, I mean I was always the political organizer but I always was very interested in the visuals and uh, I wanted coverage and I needed the dramatic yeah. shot and you know sometimes our Killed collaboration it. was just I know like, it's one o'clock in the morning but we're having a march tomorrow I need a banner I'm coming over <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and figuring out you know where to where to get the media to put their cameras so you get that fabulous yes, shot and absolutely and um, it was everything was a theatrical production and and we and we were always marching we were just it was like every freaking night there would be something and we would I don't know know how many hundreds and hundreds of times I've marched down Market Street and, and the freeway overpass that used to be there, we'd get there, that's where we'd all scream because it would echo and, and, um, and we'd march up. We'd, the old route was we'd start at Castro and you know, people don't know how to organize anymore. I don't know why they <laughs> First of all, you have the march start around 7.30 and then people can get home and you can leaflet them at the subway stop and remind them and they can change their clothes and get some food and and come out and march, but we'd march them down Market Street to either Polk or Van Ness, depending on how badly we wanted to fuck up the police. And then we'd go up to uh, California, and then we'd go up the hill to the top of Knob Hill, around uh, Grace Cathedral, then onward to Powell Street, and then down Powell Street oh, to awesome. Union Square, which we would then fill, <laughs> and then march or crawl uh, back. To the back. Uh, and we would march for miles, and sometimes at midnight, blowing our whistles the entire way. It was it was always very dramatic. And when the flag appeared, uh, you know, it just added uh, so much to it. But and it, does Paula? What, what are your memories? Of, what's your favorite memory of that time? This is Paula Lichtenberg. Well, I remember my, my first march, I, I was living on Jones Street near California, and I had no idea there was a march until I heard screaming, um, you know, you were on your way to Union Square, uh, leaving Rock Hill, and then I uh, stood out and joined it. But, um, I just remember the first time seeing the flags up and down Market Street, and um, you know, it was such a sense of empowerment. But we were, I had never thought about you know what what did the flags mean, and and I think for many of us, I mean, not not Gilbert, because I 
I can only remember Gil, thinking Gilbert in this pink knit dress. There's <laughs> <laughs> um, my little Dior. For <laughs> <laughs> um, But um, for many people, it's hard to. We, we can pass. And um, the flag, by putting a flag on your house, on your bumper sticker, whatever. Um, it's 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 a way of uh, it's coming out to everybody and identifying and um, I think that's one of the uh, really valuable. Yeah, that that's another really key thing is the way what you're, exactly what you're talking about. You know, when you when you when people do that, that's a that's a expression. About ten years into it, there was an instance where a landlord in West Hollywood made a gay tenant take their rainbow flag off of the building. And um, uh, Davidson, at the, uh, John Davidson, the, the, the lawyer, uh, who was uh, at uh, ACLU, they decided to take that on as a case. And we prevailed on that to say that the flying of a flag is, in fact, free speech. That when you put the flag, you are in, within your rights to put a rainbow flag on your house, even if you're a tenant. You are within your rights to use that as a as a as a as a form of free expression, and that's really uh, why people do it. It comes at a cost. I get uh, emails from all around the world to this day of people. Oh, I put it on my I put it on my house and it got vandalized. You know, they I had a bumper sticker and they broke the windows of my car. You know, they made they sent me home from school because of a T-shirt. So when you when you do it, you're saying something. And that's courage, to, to be able to, to, to have that personal strength to, to, to say, this is who I am, this is what it's about, or to support that. So for me, that's what gives it power, that's what makes it endure, is the way that people have used it to express themselves in, in so many different ways. So it's, it is really a phenomenon in the true sense. What it means to me and what it means to other people Everyone has their own idea about what it means, but everyone owns it. Everyone looks at it, and for some reason they connect to it, and whatever their idea is, is their idea, and that's what makes a flag a flag. It's not about the cloth. It's about the ideas that we project onto that symbol, what we take from it. So any questions? Should we take some questions? <clears throat> Cleve, Gilbert, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have been fortunate enough in my gay life to grow up as a gay man in San Francisco and just be lucky enough to have you guys around me just because of where I live. And um, I remember the first time I saw you, someone said, that's the guy who signed the rainbow flag. <laughs> and that's the guy who signed the man's quote. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, I thought you guys were gods. <laughs> and then you live next door to us, and that I lived next door to you for about ten years, and then I realized that. Yeah. yeah. No, my question is actually it's, it's kind of a three part, and it has to do with okay. the representation because okay. you made a point about what the flag, the flag represents, and I see the flag as seamless. The, the colors bleed together. We are all one. All we, colors. We're equal. All colors. Everybody is one. Um, uh, Cleve mentioned. West, the importance and the symbolism of the mile and a half, uh, 1.5 mile long gay flag uh, stretched down across Key West, and, and that symbolizing what you C all to did. C to C. C to C, but what you did and what that symbolized. And then also uh, uh, your experiences in Stockholm, uh, I know are near and dear to you, so if you could discuss those. Let me, let me about Key West. Um, well, first of all, I owe Cleve a huge debt because in 1994, he helped me get $250,000 to build my first world record flag. It wouldn't have happened without him, which I did in New York. And of course, I, that's when I became a New Yorker. I, I like got off the airplane and it was like, I've been there my life. I fell in love and I was like, wow. And I made a mile long flag for Stonewall 25. It was quite a feat. And I had always wanted to do another one. Um, the opportunity came around for the the twenty fifth. And we had a huge fight. Yeah, we didn't talk for four and years. didn't speak to each other for four <laughs> years. And then we did another world record right. flag to make up. 
but that came around in 2003 for the 25th anniversary of the rainbow flag. And, and I was approached by these people, the gay community in Key West, saying, you know, we really think it would be, because they had been in New York, they had seen what I had done in New York, and they had this idea to put a flag that would go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. And I went, oh, that really, that sounds like big enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and I thought about it, I thought, okay, and, and Florida is a really interesting and very, and very difficult state. Many gay people live there, but of course it's really full of a lot of uh, rednecks. So I thought, well, yeah, okay. I, it was hard because it was very difficult to convince sponsors that it was worth doing it in a small town. Key West is very small, 25,000 people. They're like, yeah, well, why don't you do it in L.A.? And why don't you do it in, you know. The thing about Key West that I liked was that their city motto was one human family. And then the idea of actually doing something that, I mean, literally, Cleve had one end of the flag in the Atlantic Ocean, and I had the other end of it in the Gulf of Mexico, with thousands and thousands of people doing it between us. And it really felt incredible to do it. It was just... I still was, have scars. Yeah, I fell on the seawall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, and then after it was all over, I think this is the best part. It was really thrilling, and you know, and it was like a thousand degrees hot, humid. You can't even imagine. So then we have the big after party. So we're there, and a few friends from California, and we're standing. It's like hundred degrees. We're melting. It's horrible. We took off all our clothes and got in the swimming pool, and I thought they were going to. Die. It was like, oh my God, they're naked. <laughs> but it was thrilling to do that kind of work because when you do a, a world record, it's 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 a it's really a great gimmick to get a lot of press. I mean, that just was like you know AP around the world. I did two documentaries, uh, Rainbow Pride, a, a really a, a very uh, thoughtful and well researched documentary by uh, Mary Jo Ferran and another one about the Key West City of Colors. And, and those images really were very compelling. And they went around the world. The same with 94. And then you mentioned Stockholm. I, I want to tell you about Stockholm. We, the interesting thing was I took a 1,000 meters, or it was pretty big, to Stockholm to celebrate their gay pride. And my sponsor was Absolute Vodka, so I had, you know, I was, I was doing a little payback there. And Stockholm... Very hip, gay community. Um, we got there. It was thrilling. And we're marching the rainbow flag, you know, across the bridges. And it's, we're marching past the royal palace. It's all the, the iconic symbols of Stockholm. And thousands of people, 300,000 people came to see it more than ever. And we got out a little bit past the royal palace and... And I was just caught up in the moment, and the police came running up to me. Are you all right? Are you okay? Everything okay? I'm like, yeah. He said, so well, we had a little trouble. And I said, really? After the rainbow flag passed the royal palace, if you know Stockholm, it's a little bit on a hill. It's on some island. Uh, in the crowd were hundreds of young neo-Nazis. And after the flag passed, they rushed into the street and grabbed a couple of young uh, volunteers and beat them to a bloody pulp in front of horrified thousands of spectators in Stockholm. In Stockholm. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, it's literally breaking someone's jaw and people were trying to stop them and they couldn't stop them. And it was a complete act of terror right in the middle of a gay parade. I, I, I was stunned. I was stunned. In Stockholm, which I had this idea was this great liberated place and so advanced. And, it blew my mind. And I went, oh my gosh. You know, this young neo-Nazi movement that really is all over Europe, I hate to say it, especially really? Eastern Europe, is still with us today. So it, even though we've made all this progress and we've got all this great disability and we've been able to you know, achieve a fair amount of freedom and tolerance, there is a resistance that comes to us in the form of violence that to this day we have not been able to stop. And, and that is the, the, the work ahead of us. I mean, we're lucky we're in America. And, and in Europe, it's very cool too. But it's not so great to be gay in Tehran. It's not so great to be gay in Indonesia. It's not so great to be gay in St. Petersburg or any of those Eastern European countries because what they face there is, yeah, they can't come out 
that's the interesting thing to me. I think about those gay people in China that cannot come out. There they are, slaving away, making rainbow tchotchkes, you know, in their, in their prison factories, but they can never, ever, ever say anything to anyone. They may know in their heart that they're gay. They may be out to themselves, but they could never come out to their family. They could never come out in any way other than just to have this, this, in, this interior light. And that bothers me tremendously because, because we were free. We, we, we were in 1978, we knew we were changing the world. We felt like we were part of it. Harvey said, we're all just a little drop of water in a big wave that's washing over the world. And we knew it. But now I wonder about those little drops of water out there all over the world that, that they, they're not connected. They can't connect. They, you know, there's, there wasn't any will and grace you know, in Uganda. So we, our liberation is, is a ongoing thing. Our struggle is a, a struggle that will go past us. It's, it's like the rainbow, as I say, it's, it's before us. We're talking about Hirschfeld and all the generations before us, and it will be the generations after us. So as for me, the rainbow is more than just the colors that we see. It's the colors we can't see, infrared and ultraviolet, if you want to be scientific about it. But the idea that a movement and a struggle is something that, 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 that goes past our own life, that our lives are part of it, and we join together to change, but it's more than individuals. It's even more than generations. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's I hate to say it, it's endless. The forces arrayed against us will fight us to the death and beyond. We're up against religion. We're up against intolerance. We're up against ignorance. And, you know, slowly, 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 through our own courage and our own lives, we've been able to turn the tide to a point where there's great hope. But all of that can be evaporated. I, I, I'm going to get a wonderful uh, honor this week all about the work I've done since 1978. And I think about that, and I think, well, all that work we've done since 1978, it could all be blown away like a dandelion. You know, we could be having President Romney next year this time. We could be looking at a, a Congress that's passed a constitutional amendment against us and, you know, headed to the states. We could be looking at a Supreme Court that's decided, you know, that gay marriage thing, you know, we're going to go with the Dred Scott way on that, you know. We could really be fucked. And, you know, and how do we respond to that? How, you know, do we have the organizing tools that we had in 1977? Is that kind of marching and, and, and you know, tactics that we have even, even relevant in this age? So for me, it's a very scary time now. And it really mirrors 1978. We were fabulous. We were thin. We were hot. Cleve had curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> he was hot. And we danced. Oh, the music. And, and, and oh, Paul was drop dead. He was gorgeous. We all beautiful. Anyway, are. anyway. Uh, <laughs> and we danced. And we, and we danced and we laughed and we lived and, and we had lives. power and oh, drugs and, and acid and blow our minds, you know. And, and, and all of that. And Jimmy Carter was in the White House and saying human rights are absolute and, you know, even came here to San Francisco and. And, and, you know, was doing good things about stopping the violence and wars in South America. Harvey was in office. 1978, I'm making the, 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 the rainbow flag in the top floor gallery, and the gay band is organizing downstairs, the gay men's chorus, and theater rhinoceros. All this power, all this cultural power, all this artistic expression, everything going up, up, up. We were on the way up. 1978 was our moment. Ronald Reagan, ah, he'll never be president. It happened. <clears throat> and that's what worries me today. Is it seems like we have Obama, we have, we have all these great organizations, we have all this power, we have all this visibility. We're on our way up. But it could all blow away in an instant. Okay, that's too depressing. No, it isn't. <laughs> but it's very real. It's and real. I'm sorry to And be so whatever real. the fight is that we come up against, <laughs> there will be symbols that we use. There will be visual images that we create to move things forward. Part of the purpose is simply to grab people's imagination, to, to give them some inspiration. Sometimes it's just trying to come up with a good shot for the camera to get so that you're on the evening news. 
sometimes it's an organizing opportunity. When we did the mile and mile half long flags, how many people did we have to then recruit to carry it? Uh, the last time we unfolded the quilt, it took 15,000 trained volunteers just to unfold the quilt. So that's how it all works together. Uh, it's part of why these things are so important. It's part of why they're significant. And we in San Francisco who see the rainbow flag all the time and see it on keychains and bumper stickers and caps and dog collars and the rest of it, um, I think there's a tendency to kind of uh, trivialize it and, and to make fun of it. And I do this too and I love teasing him about it, you know. And, but, uh, you know, in the last week or two, we have seen young queer people carrying your flag in the streets of Belgrade and Moscow and being beaten by fascists and arrested by police simply for carrying the flag. Uh, and you, you referenced China. Um, uh, on Sunday, 500 uh, gay and lesbian people in Shanghai gathered together for their second uh, pride celebration. I, my friend who was there uh, described it and, and said that they were very, very brave and that the police were there and were monitoring it, but people showed up, 500 people. And I said, do you have any photos I could post on Facebook? And he said, are you crazy? Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it remains a very, very potent and powerful symbol. And uh, I'm, I, I, I'm curious to see what symbols will come in the future. Certainly the, the AIDS movement also, again, was really strengthened and advanced by some really important artistic choices that were made yes. by people who, you know... Let me who, just mention, of course, obviously the Names Project was, was pivotal. I'll get back to that. But, but the way that ACT UP reinvented the Pink Triangle, yeah. they, they, they used that silence equals death was one of the most brilliant uh, logo campaigns ever. It was stunning. And the way that they used the Pink Triangle to, uh, to alert and alarm us that this is a Holocaust happening to us. And it was. I mean, we lived here. And half our friends died. So... You know, uh, incredible. Now, I, I, I remember, okay, this is a funny story. Ah, I got this idea. We're going to bury these ladders over by the federal building. And so Cleve's got, oh, what are you talking about? They're all coming up. So they come up to my house, and he's got all these pieces of cardboard and, uh, and, uh, and magic markers. And I want you to write these names down. So we're all... Paul. And yes, and Bill Paul taught us how to do calligraphy, so it all had a look. You know, it wasn't just like it was. It had a look. You know, it, was just, <laughs> it was really good. And Cleve, sure enough, put all these ladders buried in the shrubbery of the federal building. And then we got there in this big march, and all of a sudden, these uh, names were going up on the federal building. And then that's the 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 beginning, really, the impetus of the quilt, because you know, Cleve was like, well. You know, this is powerful stuff. So the way that the quilt became, in, in a way, like the flag, it became, it, became, it became an idea. You know, it was more than just the individual panels that people were, were sewing to commemorate their, their loved ones. It became an idea that there, there had been this incredible, uh, horrible Holocaust that had happened to us. So, you know, I... I they call us the Schmada Queens, big fabric queens. And we wear it proudly. <laughs> also that came out of that was the um, AIDS art vigil. Yeah. And, sure. and talk, people talk about an occupation. Um, they occupied that little piece of grass. For years. I uh, was arrested there, I think, eight times. Yeah, um, yeah for 10 years yeah, they years. occupied. And those occupiers, they pooped out in the first winter. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Any more questions? Yes. We're, we're fortunate enough to give tours in the Castro, and we each of us always show a picture of you with the flag. Oh. And my it better friend, be a good one. It is your <laughs> <laughs> I look good, I think. What additional things besides being a San Francisco artist that created the flag should we tell people about you? What do you want us to <laughs> you mean how sexy and brilliant and charming and really Fabulous. Fabulous. Fine. Single. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, my life is, I, I am an artist. It's what I do. I, it's, 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 it's what my passion. Um, I love sewing. That's where it all comes from. 
you know, I didn't just make the rainbow flag. It came from years of making gowns and dresses and leave calling up, needing a protest banner for some march. And so I, I always use my skills as a, as a scene master, as I prefer to be called, uh, to, to, to do things. So um, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I'm so defined by my work. I mean, that's the other thing for me. I'm not really a celebrity. Most art is celebrity based. Um, the flag doesn't really work that way. I'm not even really sure it qualifies as art. I think of it as art. But um, um, I don't know if I could answer that because I'm, it's so, I'm, I am who I am. So. In listening to you, tell me if any of this is wrong. Oh, okay. Okay, so you have a, a, a pink Dior in it dress. I did, Vietnam I got it for 50 veteran. cents. Vietnam era veteran. I was actually, I was lucky enough to be stationed in San Francisco. That's how I got here. Oh, see, okay, that is like great. I was a nurse. No, oh, even better. From where? I grew up in Kansas, and I got drafted on my 19th birthday. <laughs> oh, seriously, Kansas? Yeah, I grew up in Kansas. Yeah, I was oh born in a little God. town. I grew up in a little town. Yeah, yeah. I got the red shoes. I'm wearing them tonight. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm the same story that happened. Like Cleve came from Scotland. We all came here in the '70s. It was a wave of people that we just bailed out of these horrible existences that we had, and, and chose to be free and invent our our new life in San Francisco, and and to form our new families. My brother, you know, to make to make a new thing, and and we did. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, a quick comment on that. Um, you mentioned Belgrade in, in Shanghai, and I think you don't even have to go like that far. Uh, I work in a large corporate building, you know, 20 floors, and I receive uh, a flight month in the morning. We hand out uh, the rainbow flag of Cuba, and out of the 800, 1,000 folks that work in that building, there is still resistance and, and fear and angst and there's that potency of that symbol still like from 34 years ago here in the Bay Area where people are are afraid of identifying as being gay or lesbian or even being an ally of, of the gay lesbian employees too. So it, it, it's sort of um, interesting that even like in the in the belly button of the gay world it's happening here um so that was my quick comment my question is what about judy garland in over the rainbow oh i love that judy garland over the rainbow wizard of oz but i happen to come from mick jagger and the <laughs> <Rolling Stones. laughs> It's all about LSD. Yeah. And there was, a, there was a rainbow flag in the French Revolution. There was. And the rainbow was used by, which, is it Peru? Yeah. Yes. yes. It, uh, the Incas. A little different. Um, but yes, like we said, it, it has, you know, here's an interesting thing in the Bible. In the Bible, the rainbow, I did not know this until 1994, all these years. And I'm doing the thing, and Roberta Actenberg came up to me in New York, and she said, oh, this is so great, Gilbert. I, it's just, it's just like the Bible. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, the rainbow is the covenant in the Bible. And I'm like, what? And she explained to me, and then, of course, I, I, like I said, I'm, I, I, I've learned a lot as I, I went along, and I did learn that um, the Bible is the covenant, and the uh, rainbow is God's way of saying to all living creatures, I won't destroy you. So I thought, well, that's really fitting for us. You know, we are part of all living creatures, and you know, and, and I think that that's something that, like, I, I went to Rome in 2000 for the Jubilee, the 2000th anniversary of the Roman Catholic Church, and we all had a big uh, world pride there, and when, we got, when I got there, I was just flabbergasted, the rainbow on everything, the Vatican, was using this sort of, excuse my word, bastardized version of it to sort of, you know, claim their place, and, and I thought about that a lot, and I thought, you know, there's a reason that they don't really go after the rainbow flag, the crazy Christian fundamentalist haters, because it is in the Bible. It is very specific to 
God's, it's actually in Genesis, it's one of the few places where God speaks. I, put my, I set my bow in the clouds as a symbol of covenant between me and all living creatures. And I think that that's very beautiful. And so as time has gone on, I have learned more and more and more about the rainbow. I mean, I hear the, the personal stories from people and more and more, like I had no idea that they, the, 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 the mob of women marching from the Bastille with heads on the pike carried a 10 colored rainbow flag to Versailles to arrest Louis, matter of fact. And um, so for me, the, the, uh, the education that I got about the rainbow flag um, is continuing. It, just, it, it never ceases to amaze me, you know, what I learned. Whose head would you like to put on a pike? Oh, let's see. I'll have to move on. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, back? No, you mentioned that there's a long flag tradition. Yes. Can you talk about that a little Well, it's a city of flags because it has wind. They fly beautifully. And um, I think it comes from the shipbuilders, really, at the, at the, when, the, when they were really building here in the, in the 1880s. Flags were very popular, especially um, uh, in the late 19th century. You know, okay, and certainly just have one more little thing. Wait, 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 and also don't forget uh, the United Nations. Yeah, the United Nations being founded here later on. But, um, you know, they, I wasn't like even done with the last stitch of the rainbow flag at the Gay Center, and people were saying, oh, you're the gay Betsy Ross. <laughs> <laughs> And I took that. I took that as a high compliment. Yeah. And uh, but I really did not know that much about Betsy Ross. It took me a while to find out, and so I did. I I got into that. And what I found out was, well, actually, the American flag was in fact designed by uh, someone else, Francis Hopkinson. It was commissioned, and George Washington and he, we believe, went to her. She had an upholstery shop in Philadelphia, uh, and we believe that they commissioned her to sew it, basically. Nobody knew nothing about Betsy Ross until 50 years after she died. She died completely unknown. But in 1876, for the centennial of America, her grandson gave an address talking about his grandmother sewing the flag. And it was pivotal because all of a sudden we had a woman hero equal to George Washington, the father of the country and the mother of the flag. And that was really because the suffragette movement, which was just beginning in 1876, um, the daughters of the American Revolution, intellectual women, were beginning to organize, beginning to do things, and they knew the importance of having a hero, Betsy Ross, so the whole thing became this incredible myth about her. And then within a very few short years, all of this incredible artwork was on sheet music and, and Sousa, and there was a whole wave and, and a, a kind of aesthetic about the American flag and buntings and decorations and beautiful, beautiful stuff. That was very popular in San Francisco. And you'll see historic photographs where Market Street totally done out in insane buntings. I mean, it's just... It's just, you know, it's La Croix gone wild, you know. <laughs> and, and I think that the, the thing about Betsy Ross that, that I carry with me, and I, I went to her house, I went homage, and I, I really was very unimpressed. But I came, I came away from it thinking, well, actually, when you think about her, and you think about doing that, and what that represented, um, there were no sewing machines. That was all needle and thread. One stitch at a time, one stitch at a time, one stitch at a time. You know, she was a woman, she had a business, which is very unusual in the Revolutionary Era. Uh, three husbands, all of whom died in the war. Seven daughters, and a Quaker, and died unknown. Um, she was a Quaker? Yeah. And, uh, and died unknown, and yet her place in American history is forever. And so I, I, I have this sort of reverence for her story, because on so many levels, it, 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 it mirrors my own story. <laughs> the, the, the unknown part. <laughs> <laughs> All the 
dead husband. Yeah. <laughs> Vincent, have a daughter. Vincent. Gilbert's kind of times when we were talking about the symbolism of the flag. I remember one time being in City Hall, and you were in there, and uh, your job was to decorate the busts of Harvey Milk and Diane Feinstein in Rainbow. <laughs> Could you discuss maybe some of the most unusual experiences <laughs> you've been asked to do using the rainbow as a symbol, as a representation around the world? Something you've been asked to do where you just said, you want me to do what? Well, well, a little bit. Most of the rainbow stuff was basically me, you know, basically pounding down the doors and pushing my way in to do whatever I wanted. Uh, but to do that, I had to go into the flag industry for years. I had to pour myself out. And I and I had to you know cut my hair and you know dress up and and I was determined that that for me to be taken seriously by flag makers so that they would take the rainbow flag seriously I had to do serious flag stuff so I I got my start from Diane Feinstein I did some renderings and I got tapped to do her inauguration as mayor but she was elected and then she hired me she loved my work and and. And, and even though we politically didn't agree, we there was a lot of we liked each other, and I and subsequently hired me to design uh, receptions, state receptions for the oh, premier of China, Corazon Aquino, Corazon Aquino, yeah. and so many people, and and and, I, and through the city of San Francisco and, and the patronage and, and support of, of first Diane and then Art Agnos and then later Willie, uh, I was able to do these important civic events. For me, the big one was to be able to do the Democratic National Convention in 1984. You know, Cleve's got 100,000 people outside going, you know, <laughs> you know we got to do something about AIDS. I was inside, you know, decorating. Decorating. <laughs> decorating. But, and, 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 and all the while, and, 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 and that was, uh, thank you, Nancy Pelosi, for setting that up. And all the while, that was... Uh, even though I was assuming a traditional uh, role of being the decorator, you know, I had a big gay posse in that building. You couldn't miss us for a mile, you know. And I, you know, I pulled my Cadillac up there with the flags flying on the fenders, and everyone decked out in their little Gilbert outfits to work, and you know, coked out of our minds for 25 hours a day. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway. That was really important because all those people coming around, coming to San Francisco, the, dem the, the delegates, they saw real gay people, you know, and even though we were fulfilling that sort of traditional gay stereotype, you know, the decorator, the hairdresser. So what? Uh, okay, this is deteriorating here. rapidly. Uh, okay. <laughs> any, any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, so I turned to Gilbert on a radio program, a uh, radio program a few years ago, and when he talks about the play, he talks about really coming out of the summer of love and young people and really trying to become a banner more than a flag. And tonight I'm hearing a lot about it in the context of the redesigning of the flag. And so I'm wondering, if, was there a distinction for you? I had made a lot of banners before I made the flag. Oh yeah, I mean, I knew I was making a flag. It wasn't a banner. A banner is something we carried that said something. There aren't any words on the rainbow flag. So it was a little bit conscious to say the least. So, but it came from my banner making. And, and I think, you know, most of the people that we were friends with then are gone, but there was a conversation going on about the need for a symbol. Yeah. There were people talking about Harvey. it. Harvey. Harvey. You know, it, it was Harvey. just there needed to be something. It so, came from us. Um, it was ours. You know, whether it was going to be a, you know, when it went up that flagpole, you know, all question, it's all conversation about it just stopped. That was so clearly it. And I remember wondering, you know, well, what, what, what are they, are they going to go for this in New York, you know? Or, um, but I think everybody just embraced it immediately. And it was because there was this sort of general conversation about the need to have that. Um, well, I remember when I moved to San Francisco 22 years ago, and much of that year, I wound up seeing the flag out of Market Street and how just my heart swelled. Yeah. It's just an overwhelming feeling that I've never had before. And, and you share that with so many millions of people who have come to this city just as they're coming out or starting a new life and see those flags. It's, uh, it remains a wonderfully important and significant thing. Yes, Jim. Um, I love the rainbow flag. Uh, it's, uh, it's 
I want to tell a little story about when the rainbow became unfashionable among the assimilated homosexual population of children in our district, just my feet. <laughs> Regrettable. Uh, there was a 16 year old black uh, bush lesbian that was born to be with And I want to do a story about that for a great big news. And at the funeral parlor, there were about 1,000 black teenage white girls with rainbows everywhere. And in their hair was a coding pattern like in high school that they would recognize each other. And when you would look at the at, at the what they call the marches is what they call them, the celebrations of party on, on uh, June 26th, you will see among minority people a real embrace of the rainbow. And it always struck me yeah. about how yeah. this, this sort of tossing it aside by the most yeah, yeah. You know, we're from New York. Uh, Jim Farad and I are from New York. We're old friends, and Jim is a longtime activist. And you know, I, I I never really got that until I had been to a parade in New York because it's so incredibly multicultural. And you're exactly right. I mean, you know, my friends are having brunch, and you know, they're being you know fabulous rich white bags on Fire Island, going, "Oh, the rainbow, darling, it's so tired." I'm like, oh, <laughs> and then and then I'm and then I'm standing on Christopher Street watching wave after wave after wave of 16-year-old girls kind of, you know, it's in their hair, the beads and all the ways that they use it to code themselves and, and they love it. it it's, like, it's, it's interesting. I remember uh, a guy coming around to me saying, I've got this idea to make these little rainbow rings and, and what do you think? I was like, nobody will ever buy those. Yeah. A zillion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's really kind of interesting to me to see that one of the first things people do, kids, generally, when they're coming out, is they want to express themselves. They, they want to say, hey, this is who I am, and they put those little rings on, or their little flag, or the beads in the hair, or whatever, and they, they use it to, to, as you very aptly say, they coat themselves. It's thrilling for me to see that. I, I can't tell you what that means to me. They have no idea who I am, but for me to see that is so fulfilling, so uplifting. I mean, my life is pretty good, but you know, Cleve pulled me off the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, I've had my dark times. And uh, you know, when I see that, it gives me hope, me. Because I've had my dark days. And, and um, <clears throat> that gives me strength, you know, as an artist, to know that people really, truly love what I've done, independent of who I am as a person, and, you know, my grandiosity. They, they, love, they love my work, and that, that, that really is a, a, a blessing for me. Yeah. I remember the most moving moment when I saw the rainbow flag flying over City Hall during Gay Pride when I first moved here in 1987. Do you remember when it first went up over City Hall? Well, I remember in the beginning, Diane would let us in and we could hang a big flag on the balcony for a backdrop when the stage was over there, 79, 70, 80. And she let us put the first uh, six squares of the quilt right. up one year. Right, Diane, she wouldn't be there, but she would, <laughs> <laughs> she would like, but somehow somebody would leave the door open. <laughs> So it took a while, I mean, you know, um, for that to happen, but slowly but surely, you know, uh, the city, I think, really understood that the rainbow flag was, was really something incredible that was, that was forever imprinted with San Francisco. It was the birthplace of the flag, so it's part of the fabric of what it is, San Francisco, I mean. There. I still get a thrill. When I saw it on the Seattle Space Needle, <laughs> I got goosebumps all over, and when they when they made the Empire State Building ring. Oh yeah, that's that was great. Was, Last year was wow. beautiful. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Yes, oh, Loki. My favorite image uh, currently was when Newsweek had that uh, image of Obama being the first gay president, president. with the halo. With the rainbow halo. Obama. And I just <laughs> was enthralled. <laughs> yeah, I really hated that. <laughs> One million years ago, uh, Loki and I both had hair down to our waist, and we would go to the old mine shaft, which we could sneak in because we were underage, and we would dance and dance and just 
throw our hair all around his place. <laughs> I, I want to I talk about that because Cleve is, is a, in his other life, he's a DJ, okay? He's really got great taste in music. And music was a key part of the rainbow flag and the movement. And it came from our love of dancing. And, oh, we danced and we danced and we danced. And dancing really, to me, is the, is, uh, like music, it's, it's a form of expression that's so freeing and liberating. And, and, and for our generation, it's so pivotal. And all of the music in 1978, I remember being at Winterland, which was the great rock palace up on oh. Sutter Street, seeing um, Patti Smith, I oh, loved her, with Bruce Springsteen. And you know, everyone joining hands and dancing in circles. And, and really that informed the idea of, wow, we're a rainbow people. And it came from those kinds of incredible moments of dancing the colors and, and all of all of that music um, really informed my sensitivity as an artist. Really informed my aesthetic, and and, and especially people like Patti Smith. And and I, I did many shows for the, the the airplane and the Starship out in the park, and and the, the the whole hippie summer of love thing. Chet Helms was a very close friend of mine, and. Uh, so all of that San Francisco-ness, if you will, um, really is woven deeply into the, the, the rainbow flag for me forever. You know, I, I, I just, I cherish that. When you look at this city and what we've contributed to this particular movement, I think it's important for people to remember that all of these things that happened, happened because specific individual people had ideas and they had courage and they had backing and people, to, community to support them. But uh, this is a relatively small city and we gave the world the Daughters of Belitis. We gave the world the rainbow flag, the quilt. Uh, a man named John Sims took me out to lunch one day and said, you know what we need is a marching band. And that led to marching bands and choruses all across the world. Uh, a man named Dr. Tom Waddell took me out for drinks one night and said, we need a gay Olympics. All of these things are a gift from this city, and I don't think that any of them could have come from any other city. It was something special and unique and wonderful about San Francisco, our history, our geography, our architecture, the air, the way the fog comes down the hills. Um, this is a wonderful place. And I would just like to end this by saying, Gilbert, you are my dearest friend, and I'm so grateful that you're still alive and we're still making trouble. <laughs> and um, anybody who tries to fuck with that flag up at the corner is going to hear from us. <laughs> note of the things that, that have come from our city. I can't thank you enough and all the people, Paul, Gabriel here, who did that wonderful exhibit on the rainbow flag, Pivotal, um, that, that we have a museum. Yeah, we, we're wonderful. saving our history. Our history is not going to be lost. Yeah. You know, for, for so many years we worried. Our friends were dying. They, our families would come and take everything and it would just disappear. It was horrible. And, and to have a museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. And tomorrow night I'll be at Under One Roof <laughs> signing my latest paintings. They're little tiny miniature rainbows. They're lovely. It's in the National Gallery of Ireland, darling. <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're wonderful. And it's a, it's a fundraiser for Under One Roof. Please, please, please come. Seven, uh, six to eight tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Unbelievable. Unbelievable.